let me check are we live give me a moment sir let me check whether we are live Simran, are we live? All right, we are live, sir. Just give me a moment. Let me just share this. So, very warm welcome to our show, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, sir. How are you doing today? I am absolutely fine. All right. Shall we start, sir? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Kalpana Chaudhary, founder of Social Tables, managing trustee and chairperson of Janseva Foundation, being the change and Lagna.com. Lagna.com is a matrimony portal for differently able and acid attack survivors. I am also an active member of Fiki Flow CII IWN Maharashtra Women Economic Forum and TEDx speaker. Before diving into the guest introduction, I would like to take a moment to introduce you all with Social Tables. Social Tables is committed to sustainable development program with societal well-being and environmental consciousness. Every week we bring out to you every week we bring out to you some of the brightest mind from the diverse sector to discuss over a few significant ongoing issues. In this week's speaker series, we have our guest in this week's speaker series, we have our guest, Mr. Anil Swarup, who is the founder chairman of Nexus of Good, which is an initiative towards recognizing positive action and providing inspiration to the society at large to replicate them. He is also the author of the bestseller, Not Just a Civil Servant. As a strategic thinker and an innovative leader, he won several awards and nomination. The prominent one being nominated as one of the policy change agents by the Economic Times during the year 2010, 12, 15, and 16. He was selected as one of the 35 Action Heroes India Today's 35th Annual Edition. Wow. Before joining the Indian Administrative Service in 1981, he served Indian Police Service for a year and won the Director's Gold Medal for the Best Officer Trainee at the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration amongst the officer of his batch. As a civil servant, he held various assignments within both state Uttar Pradesh and central government. So in today's discussion, we are going to discuss about ethical dilemmas of a civil servant. Moving on to the very first question, sir, what is the ideology and the vision behind Nexus for Good? See, Nexus of Good was born out of my desire to see if we can create a parallel narrative of positivity. Because as I traveled around the country as secretary, I found that there's a lot of negativity around. People enjoy criticizing others. They enjoy looking at the negative aspect of human existence, whereas a lot of good work is actually happening in the society. Consequent to which uh, people feel very depressed because they are they see negativity all around. You look at the television, you watch the news, uh, everything seems, thing seems to be collapsing. So to counter that narrative, I thought, let's look at a lot of good work that is happening. Let's identify it. Let's try and understand that good work and see if it could be appreciated, replicated, and scaled. So the whole idea of Nexus of Good is to provide a platform to good activities that are happening around us, good events that are happening around us, so as to make people believe that good can happen because it is happening, and thereby attempt to replicate and scale that good work. So that was the basic philosophy behind the starting of uh, Nexus of Good. It is actually a narrative which is counter to the negativity that prevails in the society. Oh, wow. Such an amazing initiative, sir. It is a very good to know, sir. I really appreciate this kind of work. How is your post-retirement life going on? What are your new plans? What is keeping you occupied at this moment? No, I have, I, I retired more than two years ago and I have been busier than what I was when I was working in the government because of a variety of activities. Of course, initially, 
the first book that I wrote, uh, Not Just a Civil Servant. And then I got busy with my second book, uh, Ethical Dilemmas of a Civil Servant, which was launched on the 5th of July this year. So these two books have kept me busy. But apart from that, Nexus of Good has kept me very, very busy. Before COVID happened, I was traveling all over the country to deliver talks. I used to travel twice a week to some destination in the country to interact with audiences that range from school students to scientists to private sector entrepreneurs to senior government officers, all sorts of audiences. I used to talk to them, interact with them, learn and share whatever experience that I had. And then, of course, I'm very fond of reading, so I read a lot. And finally, I write a couple of articles in newspapers every week. So there's a lot to be done and a lot is being done and I'm enjoying myself. Wow, it's very good to know, sir. So what is your book, Not Just a Civil Servant, about? Not Just a Civil Servant was my first effort at writing a book. This was basically a compendium of a variety of experiences that I had as a civil servant. Mm. And the idea of this book was to dispel some misapprehension that people have about civil servants mm. in terms of not performing, because I've quoted a number of civil servants. I've given examples of them who are doing wonderful work in the field. So that was one. And second, through those examples, I was trying to establish that any civil servant who wants to do good work can still do it despite the problems that he has. So the though the book was uh, in a way autobiographical in terms of the incidents that I mentioned in the book, but the idea of the book was to illustrate that despite all the problems that exist in the society, in governance, a civil servant, if he so desires, can deliver a lot of good on the ground. So that's the first book was all about. Wow. So it is really a fantastic book, sir. I recommend all the audience to read it once. Uh, so why did you choose not to get your book launched by a VIP? Sorry? Why did you choose not to get your book launched by a VIP? Oh, actually, for me, everyone who was invited was a VIP. So it was very difficult to choose who should be the VIP of the VIPs. Okay. Because all those that were invited for the launch of book last year in February, they were people who I had some point in time in my life associated with. And this was my way of expressing gratitude to them for being a part of my official existence and having helped me become what I did become finally. And all the invitees, there was no invitee with whom I had not interacted at some point in time. I had. And hence, since they influenced my life at some point in time, uh, they were all VIPs for me. There, there couldn't have been a single VIP that I could single out and say, yes, he's the only person responsible for what I am today and give him the opportunity of launching the book. The idea was to share my experience with the people who made me experience those experiences. Wow, your humility is so endearing, sir. That's very rare. So due to the pandemic, like other sectors of the economy, the education system also needs some reforms. What do you think are the challenges that are in front of the education system of India post-pandemic? See, this is a very unusual situation where uh, physical contact has virtually been eliminated. Mm. So all has to happen in virtual world, like the interaction that we are having right now is in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. So is the case with education. But in education, it's trickier because there are two sets of students that we have. One is the set of the student that has an access to smartphones, to internet. The other is a very huge segment which does not have access to smartphones and uh, internet. So the strategy for these two different categories will have to be different. Whereas in terms of such students that have these access and they have access to also smartphones, I think attractive videos will have to be prepared to wean the children out of what they are presently seeing on those phones to what we want them to see and to learn something. So the real classes uh, have to be replaced by virtual classes. This is happening. Mm. I, I was always of the view that technology can never replace teachers. I still believe they can't, they won't replace teachers. But given the situation, I think we have to use technology to reach out to children, to make them learn because physically we can't meet. So this is as far as those children that have access to smartphones and internet. The other category is set of children that do not have access to smartphone. And that's much more difficult. Yes. Because I have always said that as, as adults, we find it difficult to stay in a house for a very long period. Imagine the plight of children who have to be stuck in a house for days in and days out, not going out anywhere. They must be going through very tough times. So my suggestion in the webinars that I have been having with such schools is, first, 
try and engage the children somehow. Now, engagement in terms of such children as have uh, internet connectivity is easier because you can go on a web chat, you can have web-based classes. Uh, but in case of children that do not have this, you have to reach out to them through different methods. One, of course, could be a telephone because the telephone connectivity is much more than web connectivity. So teachers can periodically have a chat with the parents and children. Second is through television because television penetration is pretty high. Radio penetration is extremely high. Many schools in interior areas are using radios to reach out to children. Of course, there are innovative ways in which I have just got to know that in, in a particular village, the teachers have got together and put loudspeakers. And wow. at a particular point in time, they carry out lessons for the children. You know, there are, there are innovative ways in which uh, no teachers are trying to reach out to children. So the challenge is huge. But I think as has happened in challenges that we have faced in the past, I think human ingenuity is such that we should be able to find answers to the questions raised by COVID-19 and we have to carry on and uh, not give up. I completely agree with you, sir. So what are the challenges that hinders an officer pursuit of ethical contact? You know, this. my second book addresses the question that you say. It runs into yes, more than 200 and pages. I, must say I, will the... try, I will try and put it in four yeah. or five minutes as to, Sorry to what, does the book, what does this book talk about because that will be an answer to the question that you raised. The but first sir, question, sir, the first sorry. question that I've attempted to answer in my book is uh, ethical dilemmas of a civil servant is yes. I've tried to understand what is ethics. Yes. To me, ethics is the sense of right and wrong that each individual has. And hence, ethics is not universal. Laws may be universal because when a law is, when ethics are codified, they become law. And that is uniform for everybody. Ethical value systems vary from individual to individual vary from place to place, vary from society to society, vary from country to country, and even for an individual, over a period of time, ethical values change. So, for example, some people, at some point in time, their lives are non-vegetarians, and then they decide to give up non-vegetarian food and go become vegetarian. So, their value system undergoes the change. Now, this ethics is different from law, because if you violate a law, you are likely to be punished. There's physical punishment. If you violate an ethical principle, it does not uh, uh, lead you to any punishment. So, for example, if if you if you support your colleagues mm. uh, in the government or otherwise, or your subordinates, which uh, there are a number of instances in my book, if you don't support them, there will be no action against you. If you support them, there will be no reward for you directly, physical reward. But indirectly, there are enormous amount of rewards if you behave ethically. Mm. That's what ethical dilemmas of a civil servant is. Ethical dilemmas of civil servant. This book initially defines, and I have given instances from my own career, that initially you have those dilemmas because dilemmas are basically choices that you have to make, whether you should follow this path or the other path. And there is some confusion to begin with. But as you evolve in this service, and as you as you become clearer and clearer and a bit wiser and wiser, dilemmas cease to exist. Dilemmas are there, but your choices become very clear. So if you read my book, you will see that initially there is some doubt about what I'm trying to do. But as I go along, later in life, I discovered that there's no doubt. If there is a choice to be made, I was very clear what needs to be done. And I was prepared to suffer the consequences of what you're doing. So an ethical person takes a call on what he thinks is right. And then he's prepared to suffer. The book starts with a couplet, with an Urdu couplet. Meaning thereby that there is this dilemma you have to perform and ensure that people don't get hurt. So it's sure. it's a difficult job to be done, but you do it. I have not merely said that what needs to be done. I have tried to illustrate what can possibly be done. The book does not have any prescriptions. So to say. We, I don't prescribe. Mm -hmm. I'm only saying what I did at that point in time. In fact, if you read the book at the end of a number of chapters, I am questioning what I did because mm -hmm. I did that at a particular point in time Later on, probably, if I reflect on some of those decisions, I will probably do it differently. As I said, those dilemmas exist in the earlier part of the career. At a later stage, you come to conclusions very quickly. And finally, in the last chapter of the book, at the end of it, I, I try and explain that if an officer wants to do a, have an ethical behavior, what shall he do? How can he do? The last three chapters of the book are dedicated to that. And the book concludes with another couplet. So my book is sandwiched between two couplets. One I narrated earlier, 
नाउ द लास्ट कपलेट इज खुद ही कुकर बुलंद इतना कि हर तकदीर से पहले खुदा बंदे से खुद पूछे पता तेरी रजा क्या है इट डिपेंड्स टोटली ऑन द सिविल सर्वेंट टू इवॉल्व एज एन इंडिविजुअल दैट ही इज रेकेंड विद एंड ही इज एबल टू टेक डिसीजन यस ही कैन सीक इंस्पिरेशन from such other officers as have done well despite the problems that exist in the governance of this country but ultimately it is his own choice he has to take a call he has to have his khudi buland for him to succeed very well said sir and uh, forget about only civil servant even we are taking inspiration i have read it though and i highly recommend even this book as well to people there is so much of clarity in what you have written the flow uh is amazing and once you start reading you just don't want to you know take a break and move it from it it is so so interesting the flow is just so amazing and uh, what made you write this book sir if you just could you know, share if, if, if you if you, if you, if you what inspired you to do this if you if you read the preface i have tried to explain yeah. why i wrote ethical dilemmas yeah. when there was discussion happening on my first books huh. uh, not just a civil servant it was gradually emerging mm. that there are huge number of dilemmas that will need to be discussed and explained mm. and secondly i also found that officers are taking are making difficult choices mm. uh, in a manner that they come to grief subsequently mm. so there was a need to put it in a structure where officers if they so desired could get some guidance out of someone who has practiced and experience mm. so the idea here was to provide examples to those that want to understand that if a particular situation arises what sort of choices are available so that he can make a conscious choice so whereas uh, not just a civil servant is more of a random expression of thought mm. ethical dilemmas of a civil servant is more structured presentation of thought in the context of the ethical dilemmas that a officer faces so this is much more structured there is a clear understanding of the concept but the focus is on practice and then from that trying to understand the the environment in which the bureaucrat functions the civil servant functions and what are the possible way out so as i said i am not prescribing that this is the way out but i am suggesting a few way out which an individual can take a call so for example uh, outsiders of the government don't understand the difficulties that a civil servant faces when he does the dilemmas that he faces this books outline book outlines that so for example everyone has a solution to a problem and they they try and ask why isn't it happening it's so simple it's not so simple because it's easy to give an idea i use the term rai saab in the book so you can give a rai an advice but to for an advice or for an idea to fructify and sustain it has to be politically acceptable socially desirable technologically feasible financially viable administratively doable and judicially tenable it's quite handful because if you falter on any of these six mm. uh, points that i have mentioned then your idea will not work for a long time it will work for a short time so for, i'll give just an example now you may have a great idea but if the political master does not agree with your idea mm. then there is no way that you can take it through because ultimate decision maker is the politician when it comes to policy however in the field a politician may not be the ultimate arbiter so as district magistrate there a lot of times that i decided what i had to do but there you have to look at the administrative feasibility whether what you seeing is administrative is possible and then for any idea to work you have to have money in hand you know yes. if you don't have money how will you make the idea work so i am giving these example to illustrate that's very easy to for an outsider to keep suggesting why isn't this happening why like for example these days in covid 19 almost everyone seems to be having a solution to a problem and they keep wondering why isn't the government doing it it's mm. not easy for a government or anybody sitting in the government to take a call he has to account for a number of aspects before anything gets done because a decision taken by the government impacts a large number of people for me and as an advisor i don't i am not responsible at all i just give an advice and then walk away so uh, you have to be you have to be you have to account for all these factors before a decision gets taken oh, this must have been an overwhelming journey so for you so oh, i enjoyed every moment of it i in my first book i written i became a civil servant and an ias officer because my father wanted me to become an ias officer at wow. the end of the book i write if i were to be born again i'd like to be an ias officer all over again because i enjoyed every moment of the service it's a different matter that after retirement i'm enjoying it even more but 
as as I was as as a civil servant, and I'm enjoying it because for whatever little I could do as a civil servant, the 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 present is actually born out of what I did in the past. That is as a civil servant. If I had not been civil a civil servant, I don't know whether I would have enjoyed my retired life as much as I do now. So much of what he's doing is the learning that I got as a civil servant at that point in time. So my civil service now is a foundation for my post-retired life. Phenomenal, sir. So India has uh, India has an immensely strong belief in its religion, but often people mistake it for what it means, which results in quarrel and sometimes violence. What is your take on that? See, my take on religion is very simple. If you if you read any religion, whether it's Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Jewish, any 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 religion, religion provides a particular guideline. Hmm. And most of this guideline is love for each other, peace with each other. Mm -hmm. Of course, in every religion, the scriptures also have certain mm -hmm. aspects which were true at that point in time when those scriptures were written. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, instead of referring to the positive aspect of religion, we use those aspects written in scriptures at that point in time and use them to fight amongst each other. I don't think fundamentally any religion teaches hatred, no religion. They may have been certain um, certain aspects, certain couplets written in the scriptures of some of the religions, which may have been relevant at the point in time when they were written. Today, most of the religions have evolved and are looking at, look, look at what has happened in Europe. Europe is a classic example, which had wars on religion between Protestants and Catholics. Mm -hmm. I mean, they for centuries, they fought together against each other. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, many revolutions happened as a consequence of that. Uh, many kings were overthrown. Kings fought for religion. But look at how they matured. They matured over a period of time. And now Europe has a single currency. I mean, it was unthinkable a century ago. A century ago, they were all at war against each other. First World War has just ended at this point in time. But now they've evolved and come together. Both Roman Catholics and Protestants and all sorts of Christians have come together. I think there is a lot of lesson in that history for all of us. Yes, at some point in time, we may have fought based on religion, but there's no reason for us to fight for religion or on the basis of religion. Most of the, I have read a lot on theology and I'm convinced that most of the religion, you know, you if you start picking up certain isolated couplets from Mahabharat, you, you can justify your war. But that's not, it was in a context that it is, you take it out of the context and you, you start a war. It doesn't work that way. You, if you look at the essence of all the religion, they talk of peace, they talk of love, they talk of communities coming together. It's not for war. Unfortunately, it suits the purpose of certain people who want to ride on those negativity and you know win the, you know win a number of people and create. So it's it's a tragedy that it's happening. You know the misfortune is that most of us are fond of masala and negativity, and that's why when I spoke of nexus of good. This is a counter to that love for masala and negativity. And that's true of religion also. You know, people pick up those isolated cases and promote their own cause using that. Why? Because we are very impressionistic. We are pretty gullible. So if they tell that, we get very excited. And then in that excitement, we do things which should not be done. Absolutely, sir. Yes, sir. Even the most educated minds sometimes fail to comprehend religion. And religion means love and peace, not violence and war. So that has you know, to they look at they look at religion with some sort of an intellectual dishonesty. And that's and so that, wrong. that is intellectual dishonesty in the sense that they are very selective about choosing such parts of the scriptures which suit their thinking of hitting others. Absolutely. Totally agree with you, sir. It's happening everywhere. It's crazy. So uh, what could you uh, we do uh, as the upcoming generation to improve the political system of India, especially? No, the I, I, I don't think we should worry about political system. If there's so many people to worry about political system. There's so many people to worry about the nation. There's so many people to worry about the society. My suggestion to most of the children that I talk to is focus on yourself and for you improve your own personality. You, okay. you can't, you can't, you, I mean, we think that we can change the world. Please don't do that. The okay. old man, the Mahatma said, be the change you wish to see in the world. What did he mean? He mm -hmm. said, for the time being, forget about the world. Focus on yourself. You know, the book that ends with Khudi Ko Kar is focus on the individual, not on others. You know, we love to focus on others. 
उम्र भर यही भूल करता रहा गालिब धूल चेहरे पति आयना मलता रहा वी ट्राई एंड फाइंड फॉल्ट विद अदर्स वेन दी फॉल्ट यू कैन डू एनी थिंग इवन इवन इफ देर इज फॉल्ट If if they have no fault in such a different matter, let us assume for the sake of argument it's faulty there. But you can't do anything to them. You can do a lot to yourself. And when you do a lot to yourself, there are ways in which you can improve as an individual. But we don't do that because we are so focused on others. You know the questions that are asked of me in all these: like, What can we do to our country? What can we do to the society? What can we do to what is going wrong? You can't do anything. I'm telling you, the only thing that you can do is to yourself. Now. If you evolve as an individual, then मैं अकेला ही चलाता जाने में मंजिल मगर लोग साथ आते गए कारवां मंदा गए then you can actually influence people, but you are not consciously influencing them. It is you become an example to others. So instead of telling others what to do, become an example yourself. Then people will try and look at you and say, यार ये कर सकता है तो मैं क्यों नहीं कर सकता? You know, it's 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 not preaching that will help. Preaching will not help. It's your example that will help. I think what If if you listen to Mahatma Gandhi, I think his action spoke more than his voice. He was not a very great speaker, but what a principle example that he set before us. So his actions, his examples, are something that can be emulated. He was not a great orator in the strict sense of the term. You have you had. I mean, Hitler was the best orator around. You know, if you listen to his speeches, people used to go mad. But look at the example that he was setting. So it's not a question of how you try to influence. You set an example and let people be influenced. You are not influenced. So once you set an example, why? Because when you put an action and people see that action happening, the belief they have a greater conviction in what you are saying. But if you are just talking for some time, they listen to you, and then the bluff will be called. So the best is to act in a manner so that people look at you as an example. So खुदी को बुलंद करिया, अपने ऊपर be focused on yourself rather than on others. that's another reminder thank you so much sir. uh so thank you mr sir for your wonderful inputs we have learned a lot from you in just few minutes this session has been very 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 inspiring now moving on to a little fun part of it with some rapid fire who inspires you the most me yeah for my inspiration has come from a number of people it is very difficult to single out i mean i have to list out the name because it's very difficult to say x you know if you were to ask me my inspiration from my birth came from different sets of people as a group but if you want to pick a single individual who did it? i think mahatma gandhi when i read uh, my experiment with truth you know i was in in critic cricketing term totally bold here was a man very simple and he managed to transform people around him because he, he had no credentials to be a leader to begin with i mean the biggest i think um, the thing that he did and i think the biggest quality of his was to admit mistakes he did he admitted mistakes and then he worked on those mistakes he improved on those mistakes to me that's a great example because every human being commits mistake i don't think there's any human if so, you can learn from those mistakes and attempt to improve upon it i think you are on the way of becoming a better individual i mean you can't become a mahatma there are only exceptions but you can improve as an individual so i think the biggest influence by way of thought i never uh, i mean he passed away before i was born long before the biggest influence on my thought process came by reading mahatma gandhi and the second person who influenced me through thought process was swami vivekananda again yes. i i read his writings and i was i was i i was hit hit in the sense that he explained his writings explained to me how much potential does an individual have that sky is the limit you can actually totally depends on you where you want to travel here was a young man he died young who traveled through the world who not only preached practiced what he preached so there was so much to learn from these two great gentlemen of course as i said from life people starting from my father my mother my uncle then in the school my teachers i can go on and on my certain officers who have mentioned in my book i they influenced me and finally my own family uh, the book has been dedicated to my family because you know it's easy for me to talk about the little success that i achieved you know it's it's difficult for the family because if you lead a particular way of life you are fulfilling your own you know ambition yes, yes, but what yes. about them they are sacrificing for you to be in the front to succeed yes. 
It's yes. phenomenal. It wouldn't have happened but for the sacrifice that my family, my wife, my children made for it. And I've acknowledged that on the first page of my book. Yeah, yes, 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 sir. And that's so beautiful. It's always to, you know, very nice to give gratitude and acknowledge. And that I have seen very rare people who does. And about inspiring, I mean, uh, you said Mahatma Gandhi and Swami Vivekananda and so many people. And now you're inspiring us. Thank you so much for being such an inspiration to us. So what's the greatest risk you have ever taken? I have taken again, you know, I, it's, it's very difficult to create no. risk. You know, I uh, As initially, thing. initially, oh. let me tell you, I took a number of risks in, in service I can talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the district where I was, I can't call it greatest because it was one of the major risks, the many risks. In the district where I was posted as district magistrate, those days, uh, the Khalistanis, the, there was sick terror was going on. And I was ultimately on the terror list, on the hit list of the terrorists, which I discovered later on. And that was a risk taken because if you have read the book, there was an encounter that happened in which five terrorists were shot down. I was there on the spot. So uh, I, it's, it's very difficult to define it as a risk. It was a conscious choice that I made. Um, and I was, I was aware of the consequences of what I was doing. So I used to take these conscious risks, uh, sometimes fighting with my minister. Uh, I mean, if you read the book, you will see those risks yes, mentioned yes. in my book. I, that's but, why I'm you know, Sorry. Yes. Yes. That's why I message you also. Your life has been a, such a roller coaster life, sir. But I just I want to understand what motivates you to do everything you have done. That I must answer. Life. That I must answer. Yes, sir. Because what I will answer you this question that what motivates me to do. Mm. And if you have read both the books, yes. there is an incident that explains this. And I'll narrate that. If you have time, I'll narrate an incident yes, just sir. to illustrate yes, what. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I was doing this scheme called Rashtriya Swast Bima Yojana. It was a health insurance scheme. Mm. And this scheme was doing very well in the country, but it was not getting so much recognition here mm. as it was getting recognized world over by the World Bank, by ILO, by UN. All organizations were appreciative of it. So Mr. Obama became president of the US and his team, some of his advisors, one of them rang me up and he wanted to understand the health insurance scheme we were doing in India. So I tried to explain to him that what we are doing in India is totally different from uh, the U.S. context. But he insisted. So in one of my visits to Washington, I went over to an institute called Brookings Institute, yeah. which houses advisors of the president. Yeah. So I made this presentation on this health insurance scheme. And during this course of presentation, there were representatives of Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and other foundations. They were also present. After the presentation, I came out of the room and we were having a cup of tea. This gentleman from Gates Foundation walks up to me and asks me this question, the one you have asked. He asked me, Mr. Suru, you are a civil servant, yeah. but you seem to be very passionate about what you are doing. What is the government giving you beyond your salary? Why do you do what you do? So I asked him a counter question. I asked him, Gates Foundation gives millions of dollars to poor countries. What do you get out of it? Okay. He said, well, that's a job, but we derive a lot of satisfaction out of the help that we do to the poor. I said, you answered your own question. This RSBY, the Rashtriya Swath Bhima Yodhana, is meant for the poorest of the poor of this country. Many of whom would have been dead but for this scheme. So the good wishes of these people who have survived and the families come back to me somehow, anyhow. That is good enough a kick for me to do what I am doing. Now, this is the kick that I am talking about. I explained by an example as to what I meant by kick. I used to visit these small hospitals uh, in, in this under the scheme. In one of these visits to these hospitals, I was talking to a patient, a beneficiary patient. Suddenly, I heard a very feeble voice from behind. And there was this old lady calling me, very old lady calling me, Betaitra. Very softly, Betaitra. She must be whispering. But I heard some whispers. So I turned around and I saw this old lady calling me and flashing me that smart card. It was a smart card based scheme. So I went to her. Now she couldn't sit, so I bent down to talk. I asked her, Mata ji, are you fine? Then I said, She flashed that card. 
देन आई अगेन सेड नहीं माता जी जब आपकी इतने सेवा हो रही है आपकी नहीं जी बेटा मेरा तो ना भाई है ना बेटा है कोई नहीं है मेरा इस दुनिया में कोई नहीं है तो मैं ऊपर वाले के पास जाऊंगी मेरी उम्र इतनी हो दिस कैरिड ऑन फॉर अबाउट टेन सेकेंड्स एंड देन मेड ए वेरी रिमार्केबल स्टेटमेंट शी सेट बेटा ऊपर वाले जाके ये बात जरूर कहूंगी तुम्हारी स्कीम बहुत अच्छी है I call them my Bharat Sadas. If you read the two books, I have narrated a few instances where the reward to me was this sense of enormous satisfaction, enormous sense of satisfaction of having helped somebody without expecting anything in return. What could be better than that? And that is the reason why I say, if I were to be born again, I'd like to be an IAS officer because this service gives you an opportunity to serve the poorest of the poor and earn their gratitude. That's the biggest earning. Such That's why I do what I do. such a noble thought such a noble vision and uh, you are definitely an asset for our nation and you have helped so many people aur itne logo ki blessings bhi hai aapke upar but so bahut inspiring aur ye jo aapne kaha that shows the amount of passion you have in your work you are totally passionate about your work wow only followers could be that passionate <laughs> so what is the most memorable moment of your life uh again you know i have some extremely memorable moments uh it's very you know it becomes difficult to pick up a moment you know mm. i have so many moments in life which i when i go back to them one i narrated to you when yes. this lady told me this yes. was a moment in life other moment in life was when when if you read the book in the first book uh-huh. i i am trying i held a old couple half one half blind one fully blind and when they came back to me to return the 100 rupees that i had given them as district magistrate you know that is a moment that gives me goosebumps even now so i have had these moments when i recall those moments i get those goosebumps and these though are the those are the moments for me to pick up a single moment will be very difficult especially in the official life then number of moments which i relish enjoy recall and enjoy further gives me greater strength to continue to do what i did it gave me those moments so that's what i tell my colleagues that if you can create those moments that help you feel happy and then enables you to create those moments all over again to recreate that happiness that's what is life wow absolutely sir very well said so if you could change one thing about your life what could it be i would like to reduce my anger a bit <laughs> if i were to be born again really lagta hai i i i mean in my in my life i have been angry on occasions where i probably i could have avoided it okay. when i reflect on those moments um, i mean i have certainly mellowed a bit but still there are flashes of you know uh, why it happens i don't know i have been trying to analyze i would certainly like to cut down on my uh, anger a bit if if i can do that the rest of it life has been fairly good uh, maybe in my next life uh, if i could spend some more moments with my family which i couldn't Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. I know, and of course now you're retired, and but you you have still kept yourself busy again in service of people itself. So this is a never-ending journey. मुझे लगता है और आप कभी retire नहीं होने वाले even after retirement. <laughs> so place where you love being the most, and I think you should take your family there now. Please. Yeah. कौन सी जगह है जो आपको बहुत ही ज़्यादा खूबसूरत लगती है और अच्छी लगती है जाके आप जाके रह सकते हैं घर Right? That's why I'm enjoying COVID. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving COVID because I'm spending time at a place that I love. Wonderful. There is no place better than home. Absolutely. Although I travel so much, I travel so much, but I love being home. Mm-hmm. Answer your favorite hobby. I I uh, now of course post retirement I I enjoy uh, listening to music or composing music or playing music. I I do a bit of composition in music. I love my guitar. That's my hobby. And I have number of I love reading. I love traveling. Uh, there's so many things, but I think music uh, is something uh, I really love. So, what kind of music have you composed? Yeah, I, it's very light music. I I play the Spanish guitar and I compose music on that. This is something which a lot of us didn't know. Hobby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that's this. Uh, this one is the best question. चलो नेक्स्ट टाइम जब मिलूंगी आपसे तो मैं जरूर ना करूंगी सर बताइए आपका टैलेंट और एनीवेज एंड द द लास्ट क्वेश्चन इफ यू यू टू बी प्राइम मिनिस्टर फॉर डे व्हाट इज़ फर्स्ट थिंग डू 
I would first thing I would do is to resign on the first hour because one, in one day in one day I will not be able to do anything. <laughs> I, I, if someone offers me to uh, me to become prime minister one day, I'll straight away refuse. Okay, <laughs> all right. So a message for social tables. Uh, social uh, media, social tables, all such organizations have have a great role to play in in the times when social media. Is, is reaching out to more and more people. So do it responsibly, uh, make the best use of it and create positivity around. Thank you so much, sir. So wow, that was an amazing res response. That was quick. Before we conclude, a few words of wisdom you would like to give to our audience. I would tell them, enjoy every moment that you're in because the past is dead and gone. You, have, you can't change it, it's, it's just past. Future, you don't know what's going to happen. The only control you have is over yourself and the moment that you're in. So enjoy the moments that you're in. Future will be built upon you. Absolutely. I, I, I personally feel you do a lot of meditation. No, I don't meditate at all. I mean, whatever work I do is a meditation in itself. I wow. don't meditate separately. Uh, so, for example, when I'm doing my work, uh, I meditate because I'm totally focused on it. When I play my guitar, I'm totally focused on it. So you can call that meditation, but I don't do meditate meditation otherwise. Oh, wonderful, sir. So, well, that's it for today. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks to Mr. Anil Swarup, who, despite of his busy schedule, has found time to grace this special interaction. We are extremely grateful to you for sharing your words of encouragement and giving us valuable inputs. Your eminent presence has indeed made this interaction a memorable one, and we unitedly Thank you from the bottom of our heart for your kindness, interest, and support. We wish you all the very best for your future endeavors. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.